So um, according to our passage today, let's ask this question. What kind of king was Jesus? What, what kind of kingdom was he presenting? Our text this morning shows us, really, even in this triumphal entry, supposing it is a triumphal entry, that's something we'll talk about. So what I want to do this morning is, first of all, just take a few minutes to go through the text that Bob read this morning and just consider some of the, the background, some of what's going on there. And then I want to take a step back and see five characteristics of our King Jesus from this text. First of all, um, let, me, let me just talk a little bit about the background of the text a little bit. As I mentioned, this, this really is Jesus' official entry um, into Jerusalem, um, initiating the events that lead to his crucifixion and resurrection, what we call the Passion of Christ. Um, and so, in particular, this takes place on Sunday before Passover, on Sunday before his crucifixion. And um, at this time of year, Jerusalem is crowded, gets really crowded with pilgrims because, again, so many people are coming in for the celebration of the Passover. And so one of the reasons there's a crowd is because there's just a lot of pilgrims coming in, including people from Galilee who know something about Jesus. Now, um, our text this morning mentions right at the beginning a couple of geographical locations. That is the Mount of Olives and Bethphage. Um, Mount of Olives is this, is this mountain right next to Jerusalem. It's east of it. And, you know, it's be between Jerusalem City and the Mount of Olives is this deep uh, little valley known as the Kidron Valley. Um, and on the Mount of Olives, again, it's east. On its eastern slope, kind of away from Jerusalem, are a couple, or several villages, one of which was uh, Bethphage, the other was Bethany. Now, Jesus um, had been coming up apparently from Jericho, sort of a 17-mile trip up, up, climbing up to Jerusalem. And so, he, that comes from, so he's coming from the east, and he's going to come over Bethany. Or, I'm sorry, he's going to come over the Mount of Olives. And so when he's on the eastern slope, c approaching Jerusalem, apparently he comes on Friday and stays with Lazarus in Bethany. And it's there that Lazarus' sister Mary anoints his feet, um, and, he, and, he, and he stays with them for the Passover. This event takes place, again, on Sunday, and it's by the near, it takes place in connection with a nearby town, Bethphage, and all that happens thereafter. One other thing I should just mention about this, I think this is really interesting. The Mount of Olives is significant in Scripture because it's the place Jesus ascends into heaven, and it's the place he's going to come back down. But what, another reason it's kind of interesting in connection with this is that if you look at Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel has this vision of God's glory leaving the temple. God's glory is shown to depart from the Holy of Holies, then to depart the Temple Mount, to go out the Eastern Gate, to go down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and then depart from there. With Jesus coming back in the same way, and by the way, after his uh, triumphal entry, he goes right to the temple, where he, which he cleanses. But it's almost as if Jesus is saying that glory that's departed, that glory is now returned. And so, there's a lot going on here as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. We see the uh, preparation for Jesus' entry in verses 1 through 3. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, okay, to the Mount of Olives, so it's on the eastern slope, 
Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, and by the way, um, I think it's Luke that tells us that uh, the two disciples here are Peter and John. He said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Now, it's, it's not entirely clear as to whether or not Jesus has made a prior arrangement with the owner of the donkey and, and the colt, or whether or not, um, like a king can do, he just requisitions them for a time. I'm um, not quite sure. But the fact that he secures these animals is important. And, we're going to, and Matthew's going to tell us the importance of this in verses 4 and 5. But, but what Jesus is doing here is significantly fulfilling Scripture. And he's trying to communicate the kind of king he is. As Lord and King, he has the right to requisition something. And so if somebody asks you, you say, the Lord needs it, okay, we're done. But again, he's seeking to fulfill Scripture and demonstrate the kind of Lord he is. And so, verses 4 to 5 tell us why this is significant. Look at verse 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Like Jesus, Matthew, too, recognizes this is a fulfillment of what is spoken in Zechariah, particularly Zechariah um, chapter... 9, verse 9. And so, there's a symbolism here. What would you expect a triumphant king to be riding? You'd expect him to be riding a white horse, right? Here I am. And he's not. It's a donkey. In fact, it's a colt of a donkey. Um, the other biblical, uh, the other gospel writers stress the fact that he, he came on the colt. Matthew tells us it's a colt along with apparently its mother, probably because the colt, you know, by itself would be all skittish. So the, the donkey kind of just is with them or with the colt and kind of calming him. But presumably Jesus sat on the colt and or maybe in a combination or whatever. But he goes in. And this is demonstrating what? Well, it's demonstrating, first of all, humility, meekness. He's not coming as a victorious king. He's coming in humbleness, in uniqueness. And it's interesting, there are a couple examples in the Old Testament where a king does ride a donkey. For example, Judges 5.10 and 1 Kings 1.3. And this suggests that the king is coming in peace. Uh, it suggests rulers ride chargers when it's wartime. Rulers ride donkeys in times of peace. So he's, he's bringing peace to the city. He's coming in humility and service. This is why I raised the question at the beginning. Okay, is this really a triumphal entry? Let me, let me give you an example in Scripture of Jesus riding on a white horse. You ready? Here's an example of Jesus riding on a white horse. Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is when he wipes out his enemies. There's no meekness and um, humility here. There's just utter judge justice and triumph. And it is not a contest. He's going to do that. That's not what he's doing here. This is triumph. This is coming in, humi in humility and weakness, okay, and meekness. But make no mistake, he is coming to fulfill Scripture, because this is what Scripture says. 
So this isn't an accident. This is on purpose. And so the entry itself is described in verses 6 through 9. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the crowd is celebrating. They're excited. And notice uh, Matthew tells us at least three things they're doing here. Number one, they're laying their own cloaks on the road. By the way, that's a pretty big deal. You know, for us, yeah, we change clothes all the time. We wash them and all. Okay, well, you know, clothes were expensive. People didn't have a lot of clothes. They didn't have a lot of cloaks. They didn't have like a closet full. Um, those things had a, those, you know, you had a cloak, it's got to last a long time because it cost a lot of money. And they took them and boom, laid them on the road for Jesus to go over. This suggests obeisance. This suggests obedience. And we're yours. We belong to you. In addition, they, the text says they take branches from trees, they spread them on the road. I think it's John who tells us they're palms, which is why we call this Palm Sunday, as you know. Do you remember, I, as some of you uh, might remember from, if you, if you went to church as kids um, when you were little, um, sometimes the Sunday school teacher or whatever would bring in little palm branches and you'd have them and I can remember my girls running around after church when they were little running around with palm branches and stuff and um, and we do that because it's a reminder that's what they did and again this this is a this is a suggesting honor this is success, a suggesting he's a king there's there's Jewish there's precedence in Jewish history that this is what you did to welcome a king after a triumph and then they shout Wonderful praises. They, they call it, they clearly indicate he's Messiah. They called him the son of David. That's a messianic designation. They, they uh, say he is coming in the name of the Lord. This suggests what the Messiah is, a, a emissary of the king, of the Lord himself. And then they shout Hosanna, which, which could be just translated save us or save it's, it's, a, it's a shout of praise, but it has overtones of salvation. Here, ironically, is exactly what he's doing, but not in the way they're thinking. They want to be saved from the Romans. He's, going to do, he's got bigger fish to fry. So they end with, with shouting praises, not only to, to Jesus, but ultimately to God himself. So they're excited, and again... These actions, these words indicate the crowd is accepting him here as Messiah. They're, they're celebrating him in giddy triumph. They're like, here it is. And the irony is they're right. He is Messiah. But they don't have a clue as to the kind of Messiah he is. I, I've been preaching you know, a lot uh, here over the life of Jesus. We've been looking at many events in Jesus' life, and we've seen this again and again and again. Even Jesus' disciples don't get it. This is a stumbling block. He's not the kind of Messiah you think he is. And we see it here, too. It's ironic that just a few short days from this moment of apparent triumph, he will be crucified, and perhaps even some of the people shouting Hosanna on this day, a few days later, will be shouting for his blood. Well, notice the immediate aftermath in verses 10 through 11. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city, city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? Now, again, just, just, just put yourself in this situation. You've got this sort of You've got the sort of elite Israelites, 
the Jerusalemites who just live there year-round. I mean, this is their town, you know. We're the center of, of Judaism and everything else. And then, eh, yeah, and then all the, you know, the country bumpkins, they come in for the Passover. And, yeah, they're all kind of wandering and in. And, and so the crowd, again, is made up probably a lot of pilgrims, a lot of people who knew, who knew of Jesus from Galilee. And so... There may have been some Jerusalemites who kind of went out and greeted Jesus. They were familiar with him too, some of them at least. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, man, they weren't too aware. So all they know is this is all this hubbub going out there. And they go, what's going on? The whole city is stirring. It's like, wow. So you have some who are kind of really into it and others who are like, I don't have a clue. And so they ask the ones who don't know, particularly the regular Jerusalemites say, who is, who is this? What, what's going on? Why are you guys like making a big deal? The crowd said, apparently those who were praising Jesus, here they call him a prophet. Now, that shouldn't surprise us if for people who think he's Messiah, remember it's in uh, Deuteronomy 18 that Moses anticipates a coming prophet like him. And that, that coming great prophet was often associated with Messiah. But what's interesting is that they say he's from Nazareth in Galilee. Um, again, if you're like an urbane Jerusalemite, Nazareth, well, I know my Bible, there's nothing about Nazareth in the Old Testament. There's not, nothing about Nazareth in the scriptures. So, what, what? Little do they know, or most of the people know, that he's not ultimately from Nazareth. He's from Bethlehem, again, fulfilling everything he's called to do and be. I should just add, uh, we, we, we didn't read this, but I should add, you know what's interesting? The first place he goes with this triumphal entry, the first place he goes is to the temple. And what does he do? He cleanses it. So there's all this buzzing, there's all this stirring, there's some like, yeah, he's the king, and there's other like, who is this guy? Why, he's from Nazareth, huh? And he goes in, and he makes sure everybody gets, uh, all the religious leaders get super alienated because he cleanses the temple for its wickedness. And they're not happy about that. This guy is stirring things up. He's going to get the Romans off after us. And now he's attacking us. Now, there's been this conflict going on with the religious leaders for a long time. This brings it to a head, and now they're ready to conspire to put him to death. So again, what is he there to do? He's not coming in to, you know, politic and campaign and come on guys, come on, come on, you follow me and we'll get the Romans. No, he's got bigger fish to fry. He's coming to die. So, there you go. That's the text. What I want to do is take the rest of our time just kind of take a picture, step back a bit and ask the question, we learn about our King Jesus. I want to suggest five characteristics that this text reminds us about our Lord. Number one, King Jesus is a king who is all that scripture predicted. All of it. Yes, triumphant. Yes, Old Testament predicts Christ, the Messiah, will be triumphant. He will defeat God's enemies. He will usher in judgment. He will usher in blessing to his people. But you know what? He also comes as suffering servant. And that's what he's doing here. Matthew consistently makes the claim throughout the whole book, and we've seen this, throughout the whole book, that Jesus is fulfilling scripture again and again and again. And what he's doing here, Matthew once again reminds us, is fulfilling scripture. He is all that God said the Messiah would be. He is all that the king should be, both ultimate conqueror, but also suffering servant. Jesus himself was committed to being all that scripture called him to be. It is Jesus himself who makes sure, for example, that he comes in to Jerusalem, coming in humility on a colt on a donkey, not a charger, because again, he's fulfilling scripture. And this just reminds us, folks, 
Not only can we trust our king to be all that he's supposed to be, we can trust the word of God. God keeps his word. Scripture is true. And so that we, 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 when we even think about details like how he comes into the city of Jerusalem, even that fulfills what God says. You can trust the word of God. You can trust the king. But not only is he all that God said he would be in Scripture. Second, he's a king who humbly gives himself for his people. What do, what do we usually think of kings? We usually think of kings as kind of, well, very high, exalted, eh, frankly, kind of haughty, uh, serving the people in a way, but usually, you know, it's about eh, his own praise, own glory, right? Not Jesus. Not Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said in Matthew, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he came. That's why. Philippians 1 tells us, don't look on to your own interests, but on the interest of others. Consider others better than yourselves. Have the attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus sets the pattern. It's not about me. It's not about my agenda. It's not about being served. It's about loving. It's about serving. It's about helping others. That's the pattern Jesus establishes here. Humble, sacrificial service. So let me ask you, and I ask this to myself too, so I'm not just asking you, I'm asking me. Okay? What about you? What about me? Is it about me? Is it about you? Is it all about you? Is, 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 are you the number one goal? Are you like a haughty king in that regard? Or is it about others? And do you serve sacrificially? Jesus set that pattern. Oftentimes, we will serve, even as Christians, serve others. But we'll tend to do it for our own selves. If we're really honest, like, oh, I've been doing all this and nobody says thank you. Hmm, well, fine, then I won't do it, right? I mean, I, I, I can feel that way. What a pattern does Jesus say? Our king says, follow me into the path of humble, self-sacrificial service, esteeming others better than yourself, because that's what our king did. You know what I'm reminded up here? It just came to mind now. Go back. We talked about this uh, a while ago. I preached on the, the Christ temptation. But just go back there a minute. So really, what, what, is, what is Satan tempting with Jesus with? He's not tempting Jesus in the sense of saying, prove to me you're the son of God. He, he believes that. What he says is, if you're the son of God, why do you have to go the way of a cross? Hey, guess what? You serve me. You, you praise me. I'll give you it all now. You don't have to go that way. Jesus went that way. Because ultimately, it was about delivering his people. Thirdly, he's not just the one who fulfills all scripture. Not only is a king who humbly gives himself for his people, but thirdly, He's a king easily misunderstood. Now, to their credit, the crowd did acknowledge him as Messiah. Good for them. Many of them didn't last in that uh, assessment, but they did there. So, okay, good. But they also clearly misunderstood what kind of Messiah he was, just like his own disciples did oftentimes. They wanted a political deliverer. They wanted deliverance from Rome. They wanted Israel to be prominent again. But you know, he offered much more. He offered life. He offered redemption from sin in all its forms and effect. He offered restoration and reconciliation with the living God. 
Unfortunately, today, many people continue to misunderstand Jesus' kingship and who he is. Some ways, and by the way, certainly non-believers do this, right? If you talk to your friends or family members who aren't believers, they ask you, what do you think about Jesus? They'll, they'll typically, not you, not, not always, but almost always, have some really nice things to say. Oh, Jesus is a good man. Oh, we should be loving like Jesus. I mean, so, you know, go on. okay, that's true. He is loving. We should be like him. And he was good. Yeah, he was good. And he was a good man. Yeah, he was a man. He was also God, but he's a man. Yeah. So, yeah, but they, there's a lot they miss. The problem is, even we as believers sometimes can misunderstand our own king. For example, Jesus came in humility in service. And sometimes we as believers can get stuck there and forget he's now triumphant Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father coming again to defeat all who oppose him. Okay? So he has won victory over sin, Satan, and death. He is Lord. And what that means is, folks, there's hope. There's hope in your own battles and struggles, for example, with sin. God is at work. You don't have to give up. You don't have to say, well, you know, I guess I'll never grow. You can, because you have a Lord, and you have the Spirit whom the Lord sent to be with us, to help us in our battle with sin. And yet, there's another way we can misunderstand him, and it goes exactly the opposite direction. This acknowledges, yes, he's... He's victorious, Lord. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, as a Christian, you should now expect all your problems to go away. And if they don't go away, well, there's something wrong with you because you should just receive that. So you're going to, you know, if you're sick, there's something wrong with you. Or if you're, you're you know, your finances are bad or just you're, you're, you're struggling with various issues, there's something wrong. And we forget that, as Paul says in Romans 8, just as he was called to suffer, so we're also called to suffer too, this side of heaven. It doesn't mean not, no blessings at all. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean we're in the in-between period. When he comes back again, sin in all its forms and effects will be eliminated. But we're in the already, not yet. We're in the time in between where there is hope in our battle with sin, but there's still going to be battle with sin. There is hope um, in our struggles. God is with us, but at the same time, um, complete deliverance has yet to wait. I, I, would, imagine, I would imagine there's another, um, there's another misunderstanding we can have as Christians of our king, and it's this. It's a king who has minimal expectations. It's a king that doesn't really care if you're really obedient or not. It's a king that doesn't call for obeisance. So, you know what? Um, he loves you. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's love, love, love. So everything's great. And you don't have to worry about it. There are no obligations. Just, you know, he wants you to be happy. He's, he's really not a king. He's more like a chum and that sort of... No, he's not. He's your king. He's our Lord. And that he loves us and he gave himself for us. And he loves us more deeply than we can possibly imagine. And he loves us more than a chum will ever love us. He is still our Lord. So it is important that we understand who our king is. This humble, suffering servant who is now sovereign Lord over all, who's delivered us from sin and gives us life and hope. So, who's our king? Our king is, is the one who is all that scripture says he's going to be. He's the king who humbly gives himself. He's the king easily misunderstood. And fourthly, he is a king, and I've already just alluded to this, who demands our complete loyalty. Again, the people in the crowd that they rightly symbolize their allegiance, at least supposedly, by put, laying down their cloaks, 
cloaks. He's a king who has the authority to requisition a colt and a donkey, should he want that. He's the king who deserves that we obey him, serve him faithfully, love him. And finally, he's a king who deserves our unwavering praise. Here too, like with laying down their cloaks, here too the crowd's impulse was exactly right. They praised both God the Father and their king, Jesus. They had no idea how great a messianic king he was, but they were right to praise him. So he is far more than a political king. He's the one who went to his death to pay the sins on the cross. He's the one that raised from the dead to give us life. He's the one that's defeated death. He's the one that restores us into relationship with God. So our praise this side of Easter ought to be infinitely higher than the praise of this crowd who misunderstood him and only saw Jesus in one dimension. Folks, we have a much fuller orbed understanding of the greatness and glory of our King. Let this dominate your praise this week as we anticipate Easter Sunday. He is the glory of God himself coming back to Jerusalem. He is the glory of God. He is God in the flesh. Praise his name. So, was his entry into Jerusalem a triumphal entry? Well, it, it wasn't like a Roman triumph. You know, Roman generals win a big victory and they bring back, you know, uh, captured slaves from the, from the battle and they come in and triumph and everybody's like, woo, yay, Roman, whatever, and you're great. It wasn't that kind of triumph at all. He wasn't a conquering warrior king here. He wasn't a political triumph or a military one. It was actually a greater triumph than that. It was a further unveiling of the messianic king. A king who is easily misunderstood because he gives himself humbly. A king who fulfills all scripture about himself. A king who reveals the glory of God and so deserves our unwavering praise and complete loyalty. In as far as this triumphal entry revealed this king, this great king, it indeed was a triumphal entry. So may we celebrate and sing Hosanna to our king of kings, who is far greater than any other so-called king in history. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, we sit humbly before you and say praise the name of our Lord Jesus. Praise the name of Father and Spirit. Praise you, Lord, for this great king and his great kingdom, which we have the privilege of being a part. And Lord, this week, as we once again commemorate all that our king has done to secure our salvation and all that our king has done in defeating death and sin and raising from the dead, Lord, give us a joyful heart and absolute covenant loyalty to our great King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.